Hey, Business Building Warrior, thank you for joining me today on Silent Sales Machine Radio. But you're not going to hear much of me today, which I'm sure you're relieved to hear. We've got another great Coach's Corner episode with Brian and Robin Joy Olson, two of the great coaches on our team. They always bring such great insights from their coaching experience. If you're not aware, let me fill in a little bit of history here, make a couple of announcements, and then I'm going to launch it over to them to take over the rest of the episode. But if you're not aware of how things work around here, it used to be just me. It used to be just me selling stuff on eBay and selling stuff on Amazon and putting tape on boxes and creating content to teach other people how to do the things that I was doing. I'll jump forward 20 years and we've built an organization now that includes coming up on 60 coaches. We've got a Facebook group that's completely free. I suggest you go join it. There's a link at silentgym.com. About 72,000 members in there as I'm recording this in mid-April 2023. And we've created all kinds of great resources and content and training, including the most established, the oldest, and most up-to-date Amazon training in the entire Amazon seller training universe. It's called the Proven Amazon Course. And all that adds up to my introduction of today's episode, where you're going to meet two of the great coaching leaders on our team who've coached way more people than I do. I actually help train the trainers now, help lead the leaders now in our organization, which is such a privilege. But they really have their thumb on the pulse of what's going on in our community. Because again, these guys are coaching a bunch of our students at any given time. And one of the observations they make today is, What are those common pitfalls? What are the common traps they see people falling into? Where are students stumbling? What are those points of pivot that you just got to get past? Those significant turning points. I love this episode today. I've already listened to it. You're really going to enjoy it. I promise not to steal any of the thunder because they made some great examples today, created some beautiful word images. I love great word images that really illustrate with a picture what it is they're trying to communicate. I love the illustration with learning how to ride a bike today. Just, I loved that one, really did. I almost want to steal it now, but I'm not. I'm going to let them dive into that with you so you'll enjoy that. A couple of announcements before I turn it over to Brian and Robin. If you haven't heard yet, if this is your first or second or third episode, or maybe you're new to our community, I really need to remind you, our upcoming event, you need to remember these three words for our upcoming event, The Proven Conference. That's the website theprovenconference.com. Dozens of leaders on our team presenting 40 plus sessions for everything from brand new, completely clueless e-commerce entrepreneurs who have never sold anything successfully all the way up to six figure plus per month sellers who are looking for ways to improve and tweak their business. It's going to be great connections, great masterminds, great conversations, July 6th through 8th in Columbus, Ohio. If you live within driving distance of Columbus, Ohio, there's absolutely no reason for you not to attend, especially in light of the fact that we now have our scholarship program rolling in full force because our event is now officially paid for. That means the sponsors who have been ridiculously generous, you can see them listed at the bottom of the page at theprovenconference.com. They've helped make it possible for us to offer zero cost admission for those who need it. You can get details on that program at theprovenconference.com slash scholarship. And I will stick a link to that in the show notes so that you can go get details if that's you. That's right. You can attend our event at no charge. If you qualify, we'd love to hear from you. Then we'll reach out to you with details. It's a very discreet program as well. We're not going to call you out or make you stand up and raise your hand at the event. It's going to be just you and the couple of people on our team that are helping manage the scholarship program. You'll be there just like everyone else enjoying the content. And it'd be our honor to bless you with that if you're in a position where that could really help you out. So let's jump into today's episode. I think you're really going to enjoy and benefit this one. And hey, if you do enjoy these content of, of these podcast episodes and this type of content, please let us know by doing one of a couple different things. First, subscribe, especially on iTunes. New subscribers, if you hit the little plus sign, that's what it is, at least on my iPhone, when I look at a new podcast on iTunes that I really like, I'll hit the little plus sign. That means I'm a subscriber now. That is a huge help to us. The more subscribers we get, the more love we get from the algorithm, the more people discover our free content. 
leave a review. We love that. Five stars only, please. Anything less than five stars actually hurts our average. We're at 4.9 star reviewed with coming up on a thousand reviews globally on this show, which is awesome. We just passed 5 million downloads, by the way, on iTunes. Pretty incredible. We're so excited about that. But we need help spreading the word because we don't pay any money for marketing. We let you be the voice of marketing this show. We're doing a good job. We figured you'll spread the word. So that's the third request I have is share this show with other people. Leave us a review, leave us comments, interact with our team, join our free Facebook group, a whole bunch of ways to completely free help us spread the word as you build your business and surround yourself with other business building warriors. All right, that's long enough of an introduction. I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Robin now for Coach's Corner. You guys have told us you love these segments, so we're going to keep them coming. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to Silent Sales Machine Radio. We are your hosts. My name is Brian. And I'm Robin Joy. And this is Coach's Corner. Welcome back, Robin. Welcome back, Brian. Got a good topic for us this week? Yeah. I I want to talk today a little bit about some of the cautionaries, the areas, caution areas that some of the people we work with, we see going through and um, just kind of address those and let make people be aware of those. So we have the opportunity in being coaches in the Jim Cochran coach coaching program, which we are just, we enjoy so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have the privilege of seeing many people go through the process of building their first hundred replant ASINs, tested ASINs that they can put on their list and build their book of business. So, but what we do see is kind of some commonality in some areas where they need to be a little bit cautious because some things can come and bite them. Mm -hmm. And so we just wanted to go through some of those and make people aware of what those might be. Brian, can you tell us kind of what thoughts you have on that? Well, I think it's a great topic because we are so fortunate in the coaching space to be able to see, and all the coaches are, to be able to see a number of businesses and uh, a lot of times you see that start from ground zero mm-hmm. and go to, you know, $50,000 a month and all stops in between. And I think the point of what you're saying, or we're going to dig into a little bit here today mm-hmm. is when we see folks decide that either they make the decision or the decision gets made for them mm-hmm. sometimes that, uh, you know, they're going to take their foot off the gas on yeah. this kind of where those spots are, because it is it can become sort of easy to say, ah, hmm, this was too challenging for me Mm -hmm. to figure out how to get systematized or whatever. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. When you run into those spots Mm -hmm. where we, when we see them typically, where, where do we see when that happens? So if you do have this, uh, no quit, you know, failure is not an option attitude, then you'll be, we're going to kind of point these spots out that we've observed And, and it's different for everybody is the truth, but the most common spots uh, are kind of what we're going to talk about today. Right. Okay. So you have a kind of a way to, to put an overview on this. Well, yeah, we were reading something recently, a giant, I can't remember if it was a book or a newsletter or something like that, but there was a saying of this Chinese proverb, uh, and I'm probably not going to get a hundred percent (laughs) correct, but it was like, if you hear something, you'll forget it. If you see something, you'll remember it. If you do something, you'll understand it. Mm-hmm. That it really applies here, I think, especially in our first trouble spot or caution area, which is you're struggling um, mm-hmm. to sort of make things click as you're building your list of potential tests. Mm-hmm. And the idea of, well, I understand the concept of, of sourcing. I understand or I get the concept of mm-hmm. replants. Right, right. Right. Is something that you can realize and people tell you about. You can Mm -hmm. understand how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But But that's the hearing and the seeing. Mm -hmm. Really, you don't really get it until you actually do it, Mm -hmm. which I know I'm going to use this a second time. When we run into these challenges, you used it the first time. Mm -hmm. We can't go around it. We can't go over it. We can't go in it. We have to go through it. We have to go through it. Right. And this is the same thing with the sourcing. It applies absolutely with the sourcing part of this. Even if eventually you're going to outsource that and someone else is going to be the sourcing guru in your business, in the beginning, you have to be the sourcing guru. That's right. You are the best. And nobody's going to care about your sourcing process and your ASINs as much as you are, Mm -hmm. right? As much as you will. 
So don't, I say, trust that to someone who doesn't really understand your business. Right. But getting through it sometimes is the challenge. And you've got a good analogy for that. Right. I'd like to, I like to compare it to learning to ride a bike. Mm. Have you ever watched someone learn to ride a bike as an adult? I don't think I have, but I can imagine how, I know that people do, and I can imagine how this might go. So I learned about riding a bike. I read books. I watched videos. I listened to lectures. Mm -hmm. I got, I went to the bike shop and I bought the best bike for the way I want to ride a bike. Got the best tires. I got the best brakes. I Mm -hmm. got the best, the best comfortable seat. I got everything perfectly right. And what do you think is going to happen when that person who has never ridden a bike before knows all about it, but when they get on that bike the first time, do you think they're going to be able to just ride? They're going to crash. Of course they are. (laughs) Of course they are. I mean, I suspect they're going to crash. Be surprised, very surprised, if someone who'd never ridden a bike before, no matter how much they knew, if they're, you know, the person that has the brain that understands these things could get on a bike and make their body do what it needs to do to balance that bike and Mm -hmm. ride it down the street Mm -hmm. the first time they get on it. Mm -hmm. Just like we did. I was five or six years old when I learned to ride a bike, I remember. And, And it was challenging, obviously. It was challenging. I had scraped up ankles and scraped up knees and cry, you know, many tears. And then there was a moment where I realized my grandpa wasn't holding the back of that seat anymore. And I was riding by myself. And yeah. in that moment, I realized that before I could ride the bike, I, th- I could not ride a bike. I could understand what I was trying to do, but I could not ride a bike. In that moment, I realized I could now ride a bike. Now I can't not ride a bike. From that moment, when I was five or six years old, I can ride a bike. I can get on a bike right now. I haven't ridden a bike in years, but I can get on a bike and ride that bike. Mm -hmm. That's the click. It doesn't have anything to do with how much you know. It has to do with the practice and making it happen for you. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's my analogy. And I didn't think about this earlier, but I love that analogy because, and let's remember, this is a two-wheel bicycle we're talking about. Right. With pedals and, a, and handlebars, right? Mm-hmm. There are other types of bikes mm-hmm. that are more, just because you know how to ride a two-wheel bike with handlebars and pedals doesn't mean you know how to ride every type of bike. I and couldn't it, ride a unicycle. Exactly. I know that much. <laughs> You'd have to learn all <laughs> over again, right? It's a how completely to, different that, ball game. That is something that we see adults try to do is learn we how do. to ride a, a unicycle. And we know it can be done. We see people doing it. I Absolutely. know how they're doing it. Of course they can. But I don't fully sense. understand that because... I haven't gone through it and taught myself or been taught by somebody else. I actually got on the bike and done it, right? To where mm-hmm. I could ride the un- the unicycle, sorry. And, and I think that's a good analogy for people who come to us and they learn replans and then they say, oh, well, why can't I just, you know, make the listing myself? Mm-hmm. Why can't I, you know, make a bundle? And that's a good analogy. It's a different bike. It's, still, it's a different kind of bike. Mm-hmm. It's a different game. Yes, knowing how to ride a bike will make that much easier for mm-hmm. you but it doesn't make you an expert yet. Right. So there's still going to be some new trial and error that you haven't thought about before. Okay. So let's move on from that. So there's our analogies for there are times to be careful. Yeah. (laughs) Right. There are times to be careful. Yes. And the first time during your first hundred replens. Yes. Right. Is I must be missing something. We talked about this in the previous episode where the king of, I must be missing something. I can't find anything, right? I must be missing something. Mm -hmm. That first like rough patch where you're trying to learn to ride, you know, without anyone holding onto the seat, without training wheels, whatever it is, and you keep falling down. Yes. So how do you, how do you address that situation where it could get rough and people could hang it up? Yeah. That is a time to be careful. When you hear yourself saying, I must be missing something. I'm not getting this. I haven't got the right information yet. Be wary, be aware. Everyone goes through that. And that's a cautionary time. Don't let that get to you. So the first place I like to go with people that I'm working with that are feeling like that, and it it is a normal feeling. It's Mm. a valid feeling. Absolutely. Check what, check your process, check your time spent. We talked about this before. Mm. Check your time spent and make sure that you are working 
the items that you said you were going to work during that time and those don't get lost because they're difficult Mm -hmm. or uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and check your process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a good example of that is I had a a session with a coaching client a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about the struggle of finding these things, right? That I'm a, it wasn't that I must be missing something. It was just that the time spent was not yielding the results that they expected. Right. So we really dug into um, the amount of time that they're spending doing the sourcing process. And we started out at 25 hours for the week. Wow. 25 hours a week and, and then come into the table with 10 uh-huh. with ten tests. Okay. And number of 10 tests is Just great. Then. Yeah. 10 tests is good. But for the amount of time invested, didn't seem like it was worth it, right? Right. That can Um, be discouraging. And I will say this. In the first couple of weeks, 25 hours to 10 is not a bad ratio because you're not good at this. You're not efficient yet. I say you, but we're we're not good at this. We're not efficient. Yeah, we even ourselves. Right. Absolutely. So so that, but after time, and especially where this particular coaching client was, I, I expected that efficiency level to be higher. So we really started digging into those 25 hours that were spent doing sourcing. And then we found that there were other things that were happening there. It wasn't all sourcing. There was actually some prep going on. There was some uh, Facebook stuff going on. Like I need to check my posts and see what answers I got. There was some basically other ancillary activities that were not sourcing. So when we scaled that back, right, I'm going to go through the next module and pack with, you know, Mm -hmm. great. But when we actually got it, scaled down to or really targeted, uh, zeroed in on how much time was spent sourcing, it was around 10 hours a week. So they were really, they were really working 25 hours in their business. Yes. Doing productive things. All of these things, Mm -hmm. you know, the Facebook group, Mm -hmm. listening to podcasts, you know, learning more from PAC, whatever those activities are, but they weren't spending 25 hours sourcing. Right. So perspective yes. kind of helps sometimes. So then I was like, well, 10 hours a week and you got 10, 10 uh, tests. You're right that, on target. That's not terrible. I that's mean, not yeah, terrible can, at all for you. It, for... it can get better than that, but Absolutely. that's not bad at all. Right. Okay. Right. So let's check the amount of time, check the, the amount of focus and um, check the process. Now, if we were still, if we got to that point where we we're still spending 10 hours, Mm-hmm. and we're coming up empty, mm-hmm. then that's when we need to go back and check, okay, what? Let's do this together. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can find something that is is at issue. And mm-hmm. that's when a, when a coach can be very, very helpful. Right. Oh, yes. We were t- we only scra- scraped the surface of this the other day, but you yeah. d- you brought up the bicycle example. Yeah. Uh, we also chatted about the golf swing example. Oh, Love the golf swing. The example, golf swing. Right. Yeah, this so, is something that people learn to do as an adult. I learned it when I, I was oh, no, uh, or 30. Some people and a lot of kids learn how to do it yeah, too, right? I'm saying, but it's normal for people for to us in our generation. In our generation. They, they learned it as true. an adult, right? Okay. But <laughs> even the best of the best, yeah, have a coach. Yes, they do. They have a coach, right? And because you it's easy to get off track. Mm-hmm. And the coach can be standing right behind you saying, Oh no, you're lifting up your head. And you're like, I didn't see that at all. Oh, I, I didn't lift up my head. And, they, and they, they, they come back and they hold the stick over yes. your head and, and then it hits your head and you're like, oh, I am lifting my head. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I need, I need right? <laughs> or you see yourself on video and you're like, I am lifting my head. Well, the coach in that example is helping you stay on track. We can see sometimes things that you cannot see and you're convinced are not that way. And it's another great example of... I know all about it. I've seen all about yes. it. I've I watched golf. I've watched the golf instructors. Mm-hmm. I've watched people. I've watched the Masters right? going on as we're this, recording as this. As we're recording this, it's Masters weekend, right? There's all these great things about golf. Sorry, it wasn't a ghost. We just had a, <laughs> that door closed behind us, but it was because of the, uh, uh, of the furnace. Anyway, and I've read all the books on how to do it. I've got a great practice guide on how to be a great golfer, yep. but... Until you actually get out there, swing the club, play golf, you don't understand what all right. these things mean. And that's what going through this, this initial sourcing phase uh, is about. Now, if you got out there potentially as a golfer or a wannabe golfer, and you couldn't figure out how to hit the, go- the ball off of the tee mm-hmm. from the range, you might just hang it up. Uh, yeah. I can't figure it, golf out. It's not going to work for me. Regardless yeah. of how many times you've watched it and how many books you've read on it mm-hmm. until you actually get out there and do it. And you can self-teach your way through that, or you can have a coach mm-hmm. to help you stay on track. But yeah, okay, sorry. So this is a, we went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but I want to mm-hmm. go back to, I must be missing something. I only sourced 
I only found 10 to test out of 10 hours. And that's not bad in your, in your, not bad at all Mm -hmm. in, in your first several months, sometimes that, that will work. Here's the thing. You got to give yourself some credit for what you have accomplished. Mm -hmm. If you found 10 tests and you've sent those tests into Amazon and they've either either passed your test or failed your test, Mm -hmm. you've done more than I don't know what percentage, but a lot of the people that we work with. Mm -hmm. So don't run away when you think you're not accomplishing what you should. Mm -hmm. Remember, you have to give yourself some credit for what you have accomplished and build on that. Okay. What's the next thing, Brian? The next thing is the, we touched on it already, but the getting distracted with potentially other strategies. So I figured out how to ride the two wheel bicycle Mm -hmm. and I can ride that around the block. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to learn how to ride the unicycle and I'm going to learn how to ride the, one of those super tall, you know, big front wheel bikes, oh, yeah. right? With yeah, a little back tire wheel. Or now the I'm going to learn how to ride a bicycle with a motor on it, uh-huh. right? There are motorcycle, motorcycle there. Are, yeah. And if you, if you stop that bicycle learning, if you stop that bicycle, the two wheel bicycle with the pedals and the handlebars, mm-hmm. if you got it to where you can ride around the block. Mm -hmm. but you're not great at it yet. And you start trying to learn how to ride the other bikes and you haven't mastered that, you know, by the first bicycle, then it's easy to get distracted. And yeah. Split your focus. Yes. Yeah. What go back to what am I trying to accomplish? What is my next milestone? Mm -hmm. Make sure you're keep working on that until you accomplish it. And you know, it's a natural thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Happened. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yes. It did happen to you. Looking back, it definitely happened to you. Well, you think, oh, well, I'm doing it. So I must need to do all of the things, right? right? I must need to do all of those things. And really, we don't need to do them all. We just need to get really good at the at one of them. And then we can start going to do some of the other things, yes. right? So we talk about getting down your, your operation procedures, your SOPs, right? Mm-hmm. Get that down and then potentially outsource before you've moved on to a different strategy. Just otherwise, what happens is it can tend to be a little bit rocky. It's like if you just get this plate spinning and it's not at optimal speed, you uh, can potentially, that plate could fall off before you get a chance to get back to it. And because you weren't focusing on that, you were off trying to do something else. Correct. That is, that's true. So, you know, these looking around can be okay. Just don't go off on another path until you've met the accomplishments that you want on this path. That's what um, we found. That was our experience. Yeah. Yes. And again, I'm, I'm going to insert here. The things that we advise is one aspect of advice. Mm-hmm. This is one perspective. There are people who don't do anything near like what we do. And if you consider every person you're going to either do this method or that method or the other method, that there are rules right and wrong, and people haven't found other ways to get that accomplished. It's going to be hard for you. But what you have, what we all have is being in part of this community, being part of PAC. If you're a PAC student, there is so much information and so many different aspects of advice. You get to glean all of that. You get to decide which ones you're going to try and which ones you're not. You get to decide which ones work for you and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. You are in charge of your business. Absolutely. And even even in the coaching space, yes. right? Just because you might be a coaching client of ours mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that you have to do things in any, the way that we do, right? right. Exactly. It's you take the, you take our experience, you take your own experience and you take experience from any other and then you make your own decision. Right. And we will support that. And, and, and most of the coaches mm-hmm. have no problem that yeah. I'm saying that. Mm-hmm. If you have decided this is what you're going to do and this is what you want to try to make work, then we will support that. Mm-hmm. And we will also support it if you change your mind and decide you want to try something else. Mm-hmm. But we're not talking about methods. We're talking about ways to get your goals accomplished. Mm-hmm. You know, we support other methods as well, but ways to get to the next step. Mm-hmm. So get your SOPs down, get your get your business outsourced before before you move on to another strategy. Because this is cautionary. Remember, the first cautionary is... I must be missing something. So we, uh-huh. we, you know, we, we get over that rough patch. The next right. potential rough patch is the getting it optimized. Yes. Right. So if you don't get it optimized, it has a tendency to require a lot of ongoing work from you, which can really wear you out over time. 
This is this is what you talk about getting to the point where you can work on your business, not in your business. Yeah, we want to get we do want to get to that point where we're strategists as opposed to taskmasters. Right. right? Okay. Yeah, because it, it can wear you down at a certain point and, and it can limit you. If mm-hmm. you're the only person working in your business, mm-hmm. you're limited to what you can do. Yeah. So. All right. One other trouble uh, spot. Potential trouble spot. spot that we see a lot is when people start feeling like in their first few weeks, all they can do is find ASINs to test, mm-hmm. right? There's nothing else going on in your business. You got to get something sent in to do that. You've got to find ASINs to test and you got to look at a lot of ASINs to find a few that you can test. And you've got to test quite a few ASINs to get some replens to, for those tests to pass and go onto your replens list. Not all of them will pass. Some of them will not pass, but if you've protected your capital, you can probably get your money back Mm -hmm. and go put that into another test. Mm -hmm. But it can be feel like a grind at first because you're not having sales, you're not having excitement, you're not having those bars that people post in the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. That's not happening for you yet. You have to lay some groundwork. Mm -hmm. It can be a little boring to go through those Mm -hmm. tasks Mm -hmm. if that's all that's going on, which Mm -hmm. is one of the reasons you want to take a break and listen to a podcast mm-hmm. and that's perfectly normal. Absolutely. Give, give yourself a break. I like to use the Pareto pit principle. I like to, you know, work for a few, I'm sorry, that's not the Pareto pit. I'm talking about the Pomodoro method. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Where you work for a few, like 20 minutes and then, yeah. Break. And then take a break for five minutes mm-hmm. and yeah, keep myself going. But that can be a spot that can be kind of dangerous because if it's too boring, you're not going to like it. You're not going to enjoy it. And you're going to want to do something else. Potential rough patch that, that you can get over just know, uh, just knowing that we're going to potentially face this boring time. Yeah. Um, and, but again, be dedicated and committed. Embrace and, it. Yeah, it, but embrace it. Yes, yeah. so that's, that's this, key. This, yes. This goes back to the advice from our, our brilliant grandchildren who are seven. <laughs> yes. You can't go over it. You uh-huh. can't go under it can't go around it. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta go, go through, through it. it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Now, another trouble spot. This is one of my favorites. Yeah. I, there's no good favorite. There's no favorite <laughs> trouble favorite. spot. That's not a... Never, <laughs> my favorite time when I might be, when I might have a chance of not making this work. <laughs> well, it's the... So we send... So we've done... We got over the first few trouble spots of like learning how to ride the bike. We, you know... We, we, yeah. we, the monotony and the whole testing Not getting thing, distracted, right? getting our SOPs together. Yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot. Before we move on to this, there was a point I wanted to bring up in the previous uh, oh, okay. The previous item here, which was the remember that we're testing yes. to find replens, right? And yes. that testing process is, it is that, just that. It's a test. It's just a test. How many times have we got coaching clients who have already started down this path? Mm-hmm. And they're saying, hey, you know, I, I got stuck in this ASIN. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Amazon came in, to Amazon cut came, the price in half. Right. Somebody else showed up, or, you know, yeah, somebody showed up with 400 units and they, you What's know, outpriced me. How many of those do you have in stock? 72. 72. Oh my gosh. How come you have 72 of those in stock, Robin? Well, I was testing it to see if it would work for me. <laughs> well, no. But it sells a whole lot. Yeah. It sells like 150 times mm-hmm. a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this goes a, sort of, uh, it, it's in, it's on the other side of inch deep, mile wide. Yes. Right? This uh, idea that, well, it looks so good. It sells 150 a month, so I bought 70. I've even, yeah, and it happens to people too sometimes that I've been selling it. I can't keep enough in there, so I just bought a whole bunch and send in there mm-hmm. after the test. Mm-hmm. Same thing happens. Mm-hmm. It can yeah. happen. Yeah, so that is absolutely a trouble spot because then that can make you think, oh, this doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Every time I you know, take a risk, I get my hand slapped. Every yes. time I take a risk, it goes against me. So I tell you, inevitably, this happens to us. Yes. We, this, we've, this happened to us, you know, without fail for a while. It's like every time we... So that it doesn't happen yeah. to us if we break our own rules. <laughs> yes. That is so, and in, in, as Robin was saying earlier, like the rules for your business are going to be decided by you. Yes. We decided the rules for our business and we put them in there for a reason. Right. And then every time we went against those rules... <laughs> We got hurt yes. somehow. And so this, this is a great example of this where I like to say, or we like to say, 
the test is what three to five, four to six units. It's yeah. not that it's not that many units, right? Right. Now, and then we test every single week. When we're making our shopping list, it's just like a test every week. Mm-hmm. And if it passes the test, we might buy it again the next week mm-hmm. and buy it again the next week. Now, I realize there's... We may not buy it next week because it's not doing well right now. Right, right. So as a result of that, we miss out on some sales. Yes. Because we, it's possible we could have sold 72. That's true. But we only sent in 10. Right. So, it, so we missed out on potentially some other sales there. So could, how do we mitigate that? I could argue with you that mm-hmm. if we sent in 72, we've missed out on a potential other 60 other ASINs that we could have sent three or four in. Mm -hmm. on as well. So that's not the only way to get ASINs back. Mm -hmm. To mitigate that, we have a, you know, our rule is 12 to 15 at a time. We may do that every week, Mm -hmm. but not more than that at a time. Everybody has their own rules. And this is our rule. Okay. I know that our experience and how we, yeah, you, you make your own. I know that there's another, I hear it in the community a lot. Never buy more than a month at a time. Right, month. That, that, that's that can great. Be a rule, and right? And you, and then you use that as your sort of baseline, and and then you set that the line for your business wherever where, wherever feels the most comfortable. Right, right, right. And remember that again, you're going to test it, and then decide how many you're going to send in at a time. So mm-hmm. your test should be very, very small, mm-hmm. low risk, mm-hmm. low investment, high chance for success. Mm-hmm. So the reason you have high chance for success in testing, we've talked about this before, is because whether it passes the test or not is not the only thing you get out of that. You might make a little bit of money, even if it doesn't meet your requirements for your, for your replans list. Mm-hmm. You're going to show Amazon more sales. So when your first 100 aces, you want to show as many sales as you can so mm-hmm. that Amazon will list, lift some of those restrictions and mm-hmm. brands and categories that you're dealing with right now. Yeah. So there, there are several reasons other than that to do tests. But don't be married to any ace. And this is uh, Jim Cochran mm-hmm. uh, teaches this all the time. Don't be married. It can go come and go. It is not, it's a moving animal. Your book of business, once you get it built, is going to be a moving animal. But in the first hundred ASINs is what we're talking about right now. You're building that book of business. And in your first 10 ASINs, you don't have any place to lay that risk. Don't make your risk higher Mm -hmm. until you know that overall you can sustain that, that risk. So keep it small until you build that business. hundred percent. So if you've got 20 ASINs that you are testing or even replenishing, don't go 70 deep in one of them. No. Right. Yeah. I like to say to a few hundred ASINs and you're, and you've got risk spread much, you know, better than, yeah. If you want to do that. Sure. Well, I like to say, don't spend a large percentage of your inventory capital on one ASIN. Mm-hmm. If that ASIN becomes, you're spending a lot more on that one than any other ASIN overall, mm-hmm. or a large percent of your overall inventory, it's probably too much because yeah. your other ASINs can't sustain that. Again, after you get through your first 100 ASINs, get some uh, 100 ASINs on, tested on your replans list. You're going to look at this a little bit differently, and you're definitely going to have more capital to work with. But in the beginning, you can't sustain the repercussions of going too deep. So oh, some people can, and not doesn't yeah, apply to everybody. Yeah, some people. Yeah, can. that's true. That's true. And so just make sure that you can if you're going to. I guess I'll say yeah. it that way. Okay. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. So that was great. I just want to go back okay. and, and put the period on that uh, previous point. Great. Okay. Okay. So now. Yes. We've, we were, yes. another potential caution area is, hey, we found some success. Yes. We've identified some tests. We've sent them in. We, we you know, maybe sent off a, a nice shipment. It's got, you know. 10 ASINs. Ten, yeah, we got 30 we units that. in play, right? We had a pretty good chance that a lot of those are going to pass the test and go on our replens list. Yep. And then. We've accomplished that first milestone. Yeah. It got some stuff feels, sent in. Feels good. Yeah. And then. And then we wait. And then we, we wait. watch. Yes. Okay, right. what's going to happen with those ASINs? Uh-huh. My whole life is in those ASINs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See what happens. And it's definitely a super exciting time. You, go, right? you made your first sale. Exciting. Things That's maybe start exciting. passing the test. Or you're going to replenish them. That one, that one sold before it got there. Yeah, was, yes, those are 
Those are uh, great feelings and you should absolutely amplify those feelings as much as you can because absolutely what you focus on, you create more of. Absolutely. So, but what has happened while you're doing that? What has happened while you're doing that? You got to hold yourself accountable here. This is the thing. I call it hatching eggs. Don't send in that first shipment. I say don't, but I say my advice to you is... (laughs) I don't suggest that you don't do anything after and you sit around and watch your app for two weeks while you to see what's going to happen here. Because right. well, you've got a little momentum going and then that momentum was sourcing, um, shopping, shipping. prepping, and shipping. And then if you don't, that, that's the loop that we need to go through. Well, the final step to that loop is actually the sales, right? Mm-hmm. We sold it. But we can complete the smaller loop a number of more times before we actually have to go and check on the other, which is the sales manager right. piece, right? It's going to take a little while for that to get in there. In the meantime, we need to keep doing what brought us that success to start. Yes. Yeah, so we have to keep doing that. Yeah. Every week we have to source, we have to shop, we have to prep, we have to ship, mm-hmm. right? So don't wait on that first shipment after you sent it. We see this a lot. We do. We People uh, send in the shipment and then they're, they just check their phone for three, four weeks while they're waiting to see what happened. And they totally lost their momentum. And then it's like, oh, I got to go. It's like no, you learned to, to ride the fun. bike. You went like a hundred yards with, on your own. And then you're like, okay, I got this. Uh-huh. And then the next time you go to get on the bike, you don't, you realize that you don't because you yeah. haven't burned it in yet. Right. You haven't. You got to keep that cycle going. You got to practice yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Because what will happen is then you lose the momentum. Mm-hmm. You have to you teach yourself how to ride the bike again. Yep. And it's harder. It's more frustrating. It's challenging. Right? If you keep that momentum going. Fill up that pipeline. Have mm-hmm. the next week's sales already in there. Have the next week's sales behind them. So when these first ones that you did start selling, mm-hmm. you don't have to get off of that good feeling. You've got another one right behind it mm-hmm. coming to sell. Mm-hmm. But you got to keep that pipeline full. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Agreed. So. One more thing we can talk about here as a caution area is uh, as you're approaching five figures, Brent, mm-hmm. what do you have to say about that? Well, this is a, uh, this is sales. You're talking about in sales. In, I mean, I'm talking about uh, approaching five figures in sales, assuming that you've got, you know, you're not selling $200 items. Your price point yeah. is not, you know, super high, mm-hmm. right? You're in that 25 to 35, 20 to 35. Maybe you're even doing SNL, small and light, and you're doing a lot of like super, you know, uh, you're doing, Approaching five figures, but your average sales price is like 12 bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, something like that. Mm -hmm. The number of items that it takes to achieve that goal or that level varies depending on what that price point is, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're selling a lot of $10 items, it's going to take a lot more items. Mm -hmm. So a lot more shopping, prepping, and shipping Mm -hmm. to hit that number. If you're selling $100 items, it's much different. But if most of us are in this, I'm going to say 20 to 30, 20 to $35 range. Mm-hmm. Some people target more. Great. I, I do encourage you to target more. You can also have a good diversification of those products. Okay. Sure. That's not where I was trying to go with this. We never get distracted. Where I'm going with this is, and I'll, and, and I'll give you something that hopefully you can relate to, is when we first broke five figures, Yes, I went back to my coach and said, hmm, this is a lot, it seemed like, for us. Yes. Now, we were both still full-time employed. Mm -hmm. So this was being done on the nights and weekends Mm -hmm. and it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. We were, and we, because we were doing everything. We were still doing all the sourcing. And we were doing RA. We were going out to the store, picking stuff up. Yeah. We hadn't even really gotten into OA yet, right? Yes. So doing all the steps, doing all the things in the business. And we broke five figures. And I remember calling my coach and saying, I don't know how we can scale. I don't know how we can grow this business anymore because we simply don't have any more yeah. time. Yeah, there was no more time more available. Reasons. Yes. And if you get to that point and you try to maintain that level on your own where all of your hours outside of your day job are spent on the business and you have a family or whatever other things are going on in your life, I think you'll, you're taking a risk that you're going to burn out. Yeah. In, yeah, or something's going to happen. If you're not there, something something's going to happen. Right. So, so, so w- start thinking about how your business would survive potentially without you. Right. Yeah. What if you had a car accident during the middle of all that? Right. What if you 
you know, broke your leg and you couldn't go shopping Mm -hmm. anymore, Mm -hmm. right? You had to do something else. Or what if you, I don't know, there are any number of things, things. unfortunate things that could happen in your business. But even without the unfortunate things, Mm -hmm. you can only sustain that sort of intense, that period of intense focus effort for a limited amount of time. Right. So you want to have it, but think about the, the end of that period. Yes. So as you're going past 5,000, 7,000, 8,000 a month, that's when we encourage, we typically encourage people to start looking to outsource portions of their business because you want to be able to get some of that time back. It makes it very difficult to scale if you're having to do everything. And like I said, you'll wear yourself out. So how do we, and we've seen people say, I can't keep this up. Yes. This business is not for me. Yes. We, yeah. we argue that the business can still be for you. Just, you know, start planning for these things. There are steps you can take. Yes, there are steps you can take. Yes. So that's a good thing to remember. That is, that is a time when it can become a pretty rough patch. So here are some examples that we've come up with that we see commonly that are normal. First of all, we want to make sure you understand you're not alone when you go through these rough patches. Also, just be aware of them. Be prepared for them. Get ready to embrace them because if you can get through it, you're going to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. So remember that this is your business if you build a business. My business is my business. Your business is your business. Don't think about it as right and wrong when you get advice from, from different people. Think about more of it. Is this a way that I should try to meet the next milestone? You don't have to make a million dollars on your first day. Right. Yeah. The journey of a thousand steps. Uh, the thousand miles. A thousand sorry. miles. Starts with a single, single step. step, right? Okay. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but I, just to go back to the thing that the caution area right there as you're approaching five figures. Yes. Consider out at that point starting to outsource a portion of your business. And that's what we did. That's what we right? did. It was kind and of on accident. That, but that, it was kind of on accident. But that's but what that was propelled the, us to the yes. next made that year, I think. Yeah, right. And so whatever that is, it could be shopping, it mm-hmm. could be prepping, it could be sourcing. Mm-hmm. You know, there are any number of uh, of the of the businesses that uh, parts of the business that you could outsource, but look to start getting some of that off your plate as you approach five, uh, this, that five-figure mark, because it can be a little challenging to maintain all by yourself or even as a couple. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So... Then we say, what cures that, Brian? More ASINs. More ASINs, whatever the problem. Mm-hmm. More ASINs. Yep. More we... ASINs is going to make it look better, I promise. Yes. All right. Hey, this is good. This you ready good. for a good, uh, a nice weekend? The weather's starting to warm up a little bit yes. here where we are. Is the sun shiny? Maybe 70 Beautiful degrees. Downtown today. Denver today. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're going to have a, a great weekend. Really enjoy doing these podcasts. Yes. Um, Thank you so we much. Appreciate everyone Great in the community. Comments. Yes. Everybody is so so nice. We're, and we're super so lucky it. to to be we here. Are very fortunate. Yeah, very very fortunate to be able to work with. We have the best coaching clients. We, we have <laughs> the best coaching clients. We absolutely yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, they make us look good. They're they're awesome. They yeah. teach us all the time, mm-hmm. and we're so rewarded by mm-hmm. that. All right. So, thank you all. Yes, and thank you, Robin. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Brian. See you soon. All right. Take care. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today on Silent Sales Machine Radio. Before I let you go, I've got a good friend of mine, a special guest we bring on once a week or so around here, Mr. Jeff Schick of jeffschick.com, just like the razor. And he's always got an interesting topic for us. What do you got for us today, Jeff? All right. So today we have an interesting one. It is what I'm referring to as ungating your suppliers. So people are probably scratching their head going, what does he mean by ungating suppliers? So as all of, you know, most of our replant sellers and arbitrage sellers know, some brand, most, not some, or not most, but some brands require ungating. So you go to Amazon, you say, hey, I want to sell Nike. And the first thing they're going to ask you for is an invoice saying, show us that you bought Nike product from a legitimate source. You know, why are they doing this? They're doing it to make sure that you're buying from legitimate sources, that you're not buying from, you know, say like Goodwill or, you know, any sort of you know, market that's not acceptable to them. They want to see that you're buying from reputable sources. So yeah, you buy a hundred pairs from uh, Alibaba. <laughs> Nike. Right. Nike's on Alibaba. Uh, <laughs> same thing with Crocs. Don't buy Crocs on Alibaba. You Don't will buy. end up with. We just we <laughs> avoid an Alibaba altogeder in our community typically. But anyway. Right. Didn't want yeah, to... don't buy don't buy anything to sell on Amazon on Alibaba. Put it yeah, that way. Yeah. Unless it's a private label item. Then, then it's questionable. 
of your own. Yes. Even then, please be cautious. Okay, we're derailing. (laughs) Done done with that one. So what I mean by ungating your supplier? Well, if you go to Amazon, they're going to make you ungate where you bought it from before you can sell. Well, this is my challenge for sellers. And I'm challenging you guys. When you find suppliers and they've got great pricing and it seems too good to be true, and they're, they're, you know, they're vendors like they're calling themselves wholesalers. Mm-hmm. You should make them ungate themselves. And you're saying, what do you mean make them ungate yourselves? Probably what you're saying. That's what I'm saying in my mind as I'm saying it. So, <laughs> so, but what I'm thinking, what I mean by ungate themselves is we should make the, our suppliers live up to the same standards that Amazon makes us live up to. Because if we're not willing to challenge a supplier and say, hey, I've never heard of you before, but this seems like a great deal. So prove to me that your products are authentic. Mm -hmm. then we shouldn't buy from them. Because at the end of the day, if their products are too good to be true, you're the seller of record. So you're the one that holds all the legal liability in case of if it's a defective product, you know, maybe these were recalled units that were supposed to be destroyed. Or maybe they're counterfeit. They could have been stolen. They could be, there's any number of things that could be with them. Or they could be 100% legitimate goods. But if we don't challenge our suppliers to find out, then we don't know we, you know, we're just blindly walking into it and taking it that it must be true because the supplier has a really nice salesperson that told me so. Right. Now, this is within reason. I mean, you know, if we're going to Kohl's, we're not going to make them ungate themselves because Kohl's is not going to sell you counterfeit Nikes. Similarly, if we're working with a you know national distributor like CDW or you know some massive you know distribution company, I, I used to buy you know pet products from Amerisource Bergen, which is a huge trillion dollar pharmaceutical company. I would never go to them and say, give me your supplier's invoice to prove that your stuff's authentic because they'd just be like, what's your account number so we can close it? <laughs> you yeah. know, like, so it's you know, within reason. You know, If they're a publicly traded company, you probably don't have to worry. I mean, I'm not going to say you don't have to worry, but you probably don't have to worry because you've got all sorts of great federal laws like Sarbanes-Oxley to keep you from having to deal. They're probably not selling you counterfeit products. But on the other side of the equation, if it's a supplier that you've never heard of, maybe they've got you know five to 10 people that work for them, you know, they might have a big warehouse, but at the end of the day, they, they're not, if they're not, you know, what we'd call first tier distributions, you know, that those massive national or big regional distributors, we need to know where they're getting their products from because it's okay to buy from a wholesaler that buys from CDW because you don't have an account at CDW. It's not okay to buy from a wholesaler that buys from a friend who bought from a friend who then bought from supposedly Best Buy, overstock products that might really be selling shoplifted merchandise. Or, and so, or shelf pulls, Amazon or shelf, shelf pulls from some yeah. bargain bin outlet in a strip mall or, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, or Amazon liquidation, you know? Right. I had someone recently come to me and they said, well, Amazon sold them all of their unfulfillable inventory. And that's their, their wholesale model is they buy this unfulfillable inventory unmanifested and then they sell it to Amazon sellers to sell on Amazon. I'm like, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> That's not a that you can't list that as new. First off, and second of all, we have no we have no verification program in place for any of this stuff. We don't know if that was shelf pulls from Amazon from third party sellers or Amazon themselves. Right. So, long story short, we need to be asking these small you know these smaller distributors provide your supply chain. Now, some of them will say, "Hey, we'll give you your this invoice, but it's to be redacted." Fine, as long as they're not redacting important stuff like who they're buying from. If they give you, you know, I had one invoice that, or one supplier one time show a, our seller a redacted invoice and they blocked out the name of the vendor, the order number, the date, all the information, except for just the line item in question was the only thing they did not block out, but they did block out the price. So it just had, you know, the name, the SKU and the quantity. Well, that's not very useful, right? Because we can't ascertain anything from it other than I've got a white sheet of paper with a lot of white out applied to it. it. Yep. <laughs> But if it had been a real, you know, invoice that had, you know, maybe the prices were blocked out, maybe account numbers were blocked out, that's fine. But if we knew, hey, this came from CDW, that's fine. We do just need to know where stuff's coming from because just because someone tells you we buy this from here or we buy shelf pulls or we buy, you know, overstock from Best Buy, yeah, prove it. <laughs> you know, it's it's fine if they do it within reason. There's certain things you want to stay away from, but. You got to, they should be able to back it up. And if they say, oh, well, we don't share that with, with people, then that's a red flag because if Amazon requests it from you, you're not going to have it to give to Amazon and you're going to be the one that has your account that's suspended for not being able to validate your sources. We don't get to tell Amazon, hey, sorry, we can't reveal our sources to you. (laughs) They'll be like, well, 
<laughs> that's in our terms of service. You can't sell on our platform anymore. You need to know sure. the chain of custody of your inventory. Make sure it's coming. You can prove that it came from a legitimate source that the brand owner would approve of. Right. That's the bottom line because the brand yes. is the one challenging you at that point going, hey, I don't think that's legitimate. Well, now it's up to you to prove it. So right. As a reseller, that's part of what you got to deal with. And if anyone's thinking to themselves, man, this sounds kind of complex. Well, that's why you need Jeff Schick on your team. <laughs> it's not expensive so, at all. How can people work with you? You can sign up. We've got a monthly retainer right now. It's still $89 a month, but it will be going up to 99 pretty soon uh, once we finish the new website. So, you know, lock it in before we have the fancy new website. And it's, uh, you know, that is the price that we're going to be offering people for, you know, we don't, you know, we'll be grandfathering them in at, um, but it's jeffschick.com. And it's just one of the many things people bring to our team. You know, you can schedule phone calls with me at any time or one of my paralegals. We'll jump on the phone with you. We'll walk you through. Hey, this supplier looks good. Or, hey, this supplier's got some red flags that are standing out to us. We're happy to be part of that, you know, part of that journey so that you're not having to face this alone and wonder, I wonder if this is a pl safe place to buy from or not. You know, yeah. use us as a leverage. And, Absolutely. and quite frankly, we've probably, you know, there's some suppliers people bring to us. Like last week, I had someone come to us. Two people, two clients, same supplier, both brought up, hey, have you heard of this company? Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> and then we got to talk about why they were a not safe company to purchase from. So, and why we had put them on our do not buy list because they had failed some of the, the checks. You know, for instance, one of the big things that we noticed when we did digging, you know, on the, on the front end, it looked like it was a US website. Turns out the site was really based in China. That was something that we had determined with, you know, a third client when they first brought it to us. So then two other sellers got to benefit from that because they said, have you heard of this site before? And we said, yep, they're based in China. Don't buy from them. So beautiful. Yeah. Very useful service. Jeffschick.com. There's a link in the show notes as well. And can we have you back again next week, my friend? Absolutely. We'll be Let's here again. All right. I'll talk Thank to you, you then. Appreciate it.